Welcome to The Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. My name is Dean Detloff. I'm a PhD student in philosophy at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto, Ontario, where I study media and religion and Christianity and leftism and all the good stuff. If it's good, then uh, it's a research interest of mine. Man, that's good. That's good CV stuff right there. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, I'm Matt. I teach uh, media studies at Greenville University. My research interests are media archaeology, cultural theory, and Christ- Christianity and leftist politics, as usual. No f- no jokes there. <laughs> uh, it's good to be consistent. People know what they're getting, you know? Yeah, that's right. Um, I feel like this is just a... We've started off really professionally here, kind of clearly stating our research interests, not doing any, uh, any goofy, funny stuff. So just, this is for the... Uh, the faculty review committee. Um, here you guys go. <laughs> They'll only listen this far anyway, just to make sure they were actually on it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah, I don't have to do that. So sorry. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Maybe someday I'll have a real job and people will review me, so I was a real employee. Yeah. Um, mine's actually not until next semester. So. Um, nice. Don't have to worry about that yet. <laughs> uh, well, Thanksgiving happened last week for Americans. Uh, how did it go? How was your tofurkey? Oh my god, it was so good. My tofurkey was the best. Um, <laughs> it was, dude. I love, I love tofurkey, and people think that I'm joking when I say that. Like they think that, oh man, tofurkey must be gross. But uh, guess what? Tofu is like one of the best foods in the entire world. And if you don't think so, we're not we're not friends. Like I don't know. That's just the that's just the matter of uh of the situation. Uh, it's very good, and I love it. What about you? I, what about you, Dean? I've never had a I've never had a tofurkey. I do eat tofu, but it just feels excessive to me. I don't know. I mean, it, it's just one of those things where I've never taken the leap, and I'm not going to spend the money I would need to take it. So the tofurkey you know, seems day, excessive to you. Yes, it's just like I'm. It's a it's a hunk of tofu, right? It's just a mound of tofu. Yeah, um, flavored with soy sauce and other things that you flavor you flavor to- tofu with. <laughs> that you flavor turkey with the, the soy sauce turkey of Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it is decadent. I would say <laughs> <laughs> that's all you need, though. Really. Yeah, uh, but it's good as hell, and I. Um, <laughs> We we bought two, one for Thanksgiving and one for Christmas, and they were eight dollars. Mm. And I think that's a good eight dollars. Okay, that's not bad. I, I was I was thinking they would be comparable to turkey prices. Oh no way! Not, so. No no no. Um, right. Well, no, I just have an excuse then. Yeah, they are priced for the workers. <laughs> uh, there you go. You heard it here. Tofurkey, the food of the revolution. Uh, uh, see you, see yeah, you there. it's so good though. I Can love tofurkey. Cook it over those barrel fires. Um, I, uh, my Thanksgiving was pretty good. I live in Canada, so, um, nobody else celebrated it. Um, Just you. And, which is fine. It's a dumb holiday built on colonial myths, so don't celebrate it. But, um, my mom drove eight hours to celebrate it anyway, and that was really nice of her to do. Yeah, it's so a good mom. Out here, it's a very good mom. She is a very good mom. Uh, <laughs> she is pretty cool. She is in some ways very hashtag woke mom and in some ways not, but, uh, she's very cool anyhow. Um, basically any, anytime we like start talking about politics, uh, every conversation ends with my mom being like, uh, you know, I don't think I agree with you, but you'll always be my son. And I'm always like, you know what, mom, it's pretty much all I can ask for, I guess. So that's fine. <laughs> yeah. That's really nice. Um, yeah. Yeah, I uh, I didn't actually have any tense Thanksgiving moments, um, so that was nice. I lived kind of that vicariously nice. through other people on Twitter. That was <laughs> I felt bad for them. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird time. I don't really get it, uh, but I don't know. I, my family is mostly apolitical, and then every time they like have a conversation about it, it just boils down to like a point that you heard on television. So it's kind of like okay, yeah. well, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> See you at Christmas. Yeah, that's right. Uh, my mom does. She does buy me like uh, all the Marxist books on my Christmas wish list. Um, uh, so that's, that's very cool. Nice. Yeah, yeah. She's supportive, you know, even if she doesn't doesn't understand my yeah. uh, predilections. My mom gets me uh, Amazon gift cards, so <laughs> I can just uh, buy those thing. things with that. It's you know <laughs> not as good. She's not quite as good about that, but it's it's fine. I'll take them. <laughs> that's good. 
Um, yep, so that's cool. Now it's over. We're on the other side. Uh, yeah. It's all Christmas all the time. All Christmas all the time over here now. Yeah, not even, not even quite to Advent. Uh, last week was Christ the King Sunday, which is a good Sunday, uh, I it think. a good one. And then Advent's not for a bit yet, so we just got this kind of ordinary time hanging out here. Not that Thanksgiving's yeah, a religious holiday time. to begin with, but just we're still hanging in that <laughs> in that regular time. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, this episode we're going to kind of dive into um, one of the really interesting uh, essays, I guess, that we found in the Christians for Socialism <laughs> materials that we mentioned a few weeks ago. Uh, we'll get to all of that in a minute, but I don't want to talk too much about it yet because um, we've got iTunes reviews to read. It's to true, Dean. and these ones are uh, straight from Canada, so I'm going to read them. Fresh. Imported, artisanal, straight from a tree that somebody went out in the middle of winter and put a little thing on it and got it got it out of there for <laughs> you. Um, that's how they get maple syrup. I don't know. I like th- they told me that when I was a child. I don't remember the details, but it has something to do with like sticking a thing in a tree. There you have it. Um, so that's what this is. Mm, uh, mm-hmm. Anyhow, the Canadian website for iTunes is different than the American website, and uh, I don't like ever check it. So I don't know when these reviews are f- are from. Uh, sorry if they're from months ago, <laughs> but uh, we're getting to them right now. So the first one comes from Alter Wise, and it is Essential Listening, they say. That's the title. So it reads, As a PhD candidate, I was overjoyed to discover the Magnificast. Matt and Dean combine intelligent and insightful commentary on a wide range of leftist and Christian issues. That's Mm -hmm. uh, extremely true. Perhaps the podcast's greatest credit, however, is its mission of cultivating a theoretically literate Christian left. There are some equalization issues in the first episode, true, but don't let that discourage you from listening. Very cool stuff. A plus, five out of five stars. Wow. I added the A plus. I just feel like we deserved it after reading that review. Yeah, nice. That's a good review. I feel good about that. Yeah, I think so. Just a good, solid, all around, rounded off review. Is um, Alter Wise the name of the band that Scott Stapp was in after Creed? <laughs> uh, we can only hope. Is that Alter Bridge? Alter something. Uh, Alter Creed, but it's spelled with an E-R. <laughs> was Scott Stapp even in it? Or maybe that was the band that it was Creed minus Scott Stapp. I don't know, man. <laughs> something happened over uh, there, though, with that band and and the na- and one of those names. So if you could tweet us uh, what the answer to this question is, that would be great, because I am <laughs> not going to Google it. Sorry, are there no, any more not iTunes now, reviews? Not yeah, there is one more. Um, so the other one comes from Hammer and Fickle. Very good. Uh, the the t- title is Good Stuff. And uh, the review reads, As someone with no relationship to U.S. American Christian subculture, um, congratulations. Yeah. The Magnificast is endlessly fascinating. It's half ethnography and half faith and practice. <laughs> Dean and Matt welcome the listener into their conversations and into their lives in an easy, friendly way. <laughs> Here you are. This is what it's like. Um, uh, I got hooked because of the episode on Mennonite residential schools. That was actually very good and highly underrated. If you haven't listened to that, we did it with Melanie Campen a long time ago now, it feels like. but Yeah, really it's good a good stuff. one. Her research is super cool. Yeah. Um. I found it immediately useful as my own meeting figures out how to respond to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. That is a thing that happened in Canada, by the way, between indigenous people and the government. It ended in 2015. Um, Outside of this episode, the podcast is focused on a very specific American context. That said, Dean is Catholic, Matt is Wesleyan, and the podcast has a good ecumenical spirit. It finds strength in its properly historicized specificity. Uh, Some things the show has mentioned that I'm excited to get further into... Colon. Learning from the historical and current violences of Christianity. That's tough, but very important. Yep. Exploring the tension between Christian idealism and a materialist understanding of history. Also tough, but in a different way. Also important. Uh, <laughs> and materialist analysis of Christian institutions. Um, again, tough and important. Uh, last, my only warning to the would-be listener is... Uh, you'll regret any time you spend Googling Rod Dreher or Joel Osteen. <laughs> Boy, is that true? <laughs> uh, so uh, this is my favorite iTunes review I think I've ever we've ever had. Um, I I like the idea so much that someone is like getting some type of ethnographic experience from this. Like, oh my god, this is what it's like. 
Um, it is uh, very good. Yeah, I like it so much. Uh, man, I saw this uh, this Twitter uh, thread earlier today that was like, "Hey, uh, tell me about all the weird like Christian subculture stuff uh, you were involved <laughs> in when like in like you know the early two thousands And it was um, a very funny thread because it's like <laughs> just all all kinds of like really weird in. Uh, inside baseball jokes about like Bible Man and uh, oh, Adventures in Odyssey, and uh, <laughs> just the worst. Lots of people also just talked about how much they love the Supertones, which is dumb. If you're gonna yeah. listen to Christian Scott, you're gonna listen to Five Iron Frenzy, and you're gonna like yeah. it. The Supertones are the reactionary side. I mean, Christian Scott is all reactionary, but like within uh, the Supertones, are definitely the more reactionary side of oh, uh, Christian yeah. Scott music. That's right. I mean, they're right that time is way too precious to spend it being cool, but um, they're just kind of wrong about what that means, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, my God. Uh, man, when, uh, we just need to, we need to, we, we've been, uh, dear listeners, planning to do a music episode forever, and we're never going to actually be able to do it because it's too complicated. Um, so hard. But uh, let's, just, let's just say that Fiverr and Frenzy is good, Supertones are bad. Flat fifty six also bad. Um, I don't know. We they're just, mostly bad. They're mostly bad. They're good circle pits. Bad ideology <laughs> for sure. Big big yeah. fans of the Bushes for some reason. It's just like the dumbest thing that you could be a punk band and also be Republican. I think that's that's like dumb and I hate it so much yeah uh one of my favorite things from christian music subculture uh stick this in your ethnographic cap is uh that um that one time the demon hunter the christian metal band found out that their music was being used to uh aid in like torture interrogations Mm. and then they were like uh someone asked them what they thought of it and they put out a statement where they said you know we like respect the military and uh we don't really care like we just make music because we like it so um god bless the troops uh, yeah, that's uh, especially dumb. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, more like Demon Summoner, am I right? Yeah, dude, one time I saw Demon Hunter at Cornerstone, and yeah, that's the end of that story. Same. I saw him. <laughs> Same, the end. <laughs> and I was, un- I was unmoved. <laughs> oh, dang. Uh, Dean, yeah. This is completely getting off track here. Do you know the band Anathalo? Are you familiar? Yeah, They're I like do. They're, band, right? Yeah, straight out of Grand Rapids-ish kind of area. Yeah, man, I was cool. I was listening to them the other day. Haven't heard that in a while. Uh, Anathalo is so good. They are good. They are good. A good band, and uh, they were pretty fun. Yeah, I think so. One time I messaged them on MySpace, and I was like, "Hey, you guys sound a lot like Stephen Stevens." And then they messaged me back and was like, "Hey, we've been around longer than Stephen Stevens." <laughs> <laughs> we hate Stephen Stevens. Yeah, <laughs> the, like we cornered the chamber pop market, and he's stealing it from us. <laughs> That's awesome uh yeah the illogical spoon lives there oh very cool um band that you should listen to if you're into them is this band called the soil and the sun my oh yeah some friends who lived with them for a little bit um and they are extremely cool and good it's so funny because we've talked about this before dean not on the podcast but the lead singer from soil sun uh i was in youth group with him oh yeah that's right (laughs) i played in a i played in a praise band with him actually well, there you go. It doesn't get closer than that. You guys I are know. basically best friends. So, uh, what this should demonstrate ethnographically is how incredibly interconnected and incestuous the, uh, the sort of evangelical <laughs> Midwest Christian music scene is. <laughs> it's true. Uh, I every time I meet somebody who says they were an evangelical in the like early and mid two thousands, I ask them if they were at Cornerstone Festival and what shows they went to, and almost I think I can. Sp- I think I could say without fail, like I've been to a one, at least one overlapping show with all of those people. Uh, yeah, I know. It's so weird that we were all in one space, probably at one point. I mean, we were at the same cornerstone, so that's that's great. Yeah, that's true. Uh, well, on that on that note, uh, <laughs> one day we'll just have a reckoning. It'll just be an episode about like uh, early two thousands, mid two thousands evangelicalism. But that day is not this day. Can we just have like a uh 2006 cornerstone reunion <laughs> <laughs> all right listeners if you were at cornerstone in 2006 please let us know so we can just know that we've been physically in the same place at one point that's yeah, great yeah that a great thing good. all right um well um i don't know i was trying to think of like a good pod transition 
because <laughs> they're at Cornerstone. Uh, we're the we're the you um the uh, the youth of the nation, you know. Uh, boom! Here comes the boom! Here comes uh some stuff on <laughs> Mao Zedong. Okay, uh, that's the transition. <laughs> <laughs> all right y'all so this is really wild uh we were like i said we've been like working through some of these christians for socialism documents and people have been tweeting us and asking like hey can we please have these and uh maybe someday you can uh we've been working on digitizing them and also tracking down like who actually holds the copyrights to each publication and it's so hard to know because it's like um oh this publication is from an organization called seeds of a people's church and guess what uh, nobody nobody from that organization like is around anymore or if they are we can't find them um so anyways having a hard time tracking down who owns those rights uh but at some point we'll just give them to you i imagine i don't know it's probably fine at some point i don't know we'll just get yeah. there we just gotta it's get just that, a matter this. of uh we're, we're like trying our best to respect the labor of the people who like worked on these because they're actually like extremely amazing but yeah uh, that's right deserves to see them so <laughs> yeah yeah for sure well, so until we can actually, like, do that and just, like, give you all of this good, good stuff, uh, we thought we would do an episode on one of the more particularly interesting pieces in the Christian, uh, Christians for Socialism resources. Um, so we just have this giant stack of books that we're kind of moving through. There's so much good stuff. Uh, it's going to definitely supply a lot of really cool Magnificast episodes in the future. Um, so just, I guess, get excited. Uh, the two, two of my favorite parts of all of these resources, though, are these two volumes of these, like... Um, I don't know, study guides, manuals. I don't know exactly what to call them. Um, but uh, they were put, these books that were put together by like an editorial collective that is called the Interreligious Task Force for Social Analysis, which is an incredibly bad name. Not good for branding. Bad brand. Yeah, bad brand. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't pick that, but it's fine. It's good. So the Interreligious Task Force for Social Analysis is not not only Christians for Socialism, but it's like Christians for Socialism plus a bunch of other sort of like left-wing Christian groups like um, the Methodist Federation for Social Action is a part of it and some other Episcopal groups and a bunch of other stuff too. Um, so in these volumes, there's tons of essays on liberation theology and socialism, unions. There's like some Bible studies, which are very, very fun. Um, and <laughs> there are also these like group discussion questions uh, and like sort of like assignments like... Um, Go through your newspapers. Look for people in your congregation who have been politically active in the last few decades and stuff like that. It's really fun. <laughs> fun stuff. It's so cool. Yeah. Uh, there's a ton of ton of these volumes that are worth reading. Um, like there's like some stuff in there from uh, Gustavo Gutierrez and Justo Gonzalez and all kinds of other cool guys. Uh, Kathleen Schultz, who we talked about last week. Um, and maybe we'll get to those in the future. But there's one that caught our eye this week that we could not resist talking about uh, because it's uh, interesting and wild and just kind of a little a little silly. Uh, and it is this. So it's at the very end of um, one of these books. The book is called Which Side Are We On? Which Side Are You On? Whichever one. Yeah. Um, and it is Mao Zedong's essay, uh, Combat Liberalism, uh, which is, okay, so these are leftist Christians who have published this in like one of their sort of instructive manuals, Combat Liberalism, which is a, a really interesting essay by Mao. If you haven't read it, you should go do it. We're going to talk about it in just one second. But the really interesting part of this is that the essay is juxtaposed with a bunch of like New Testament Pauline letters right beside it. Um, so this is funny because, I mean, like the there's there's actually nothing explaining the relationship between these two things. It's just like, Here's combat liberalism, and then right next to it is these uh, like handful of New Testament letters. So they're just like um, kind of leaving it up to the um, people reading them to kind of make these connections. And there are some interesting connections to make. Um, <laughs> so in this episode, we are going to talk a little bit about Mao and why you should combat liberalism. Yeah. So uh, I think first of all, the weirdest thing about this entire project is like. Matt and I were just looking through the table of contents uh, together over Skype and just thumbing through some pretty wild essays that are really good. And I just saw like in the in the table of contents, um, combat liberalism. And it's like, what? Uh, well, surely that that can't be like what you think it is. And you get there and nonetheless, like there's just a giant picture of Mao hanging out and it is what it is. Uh, just plain, <laughs> plain as day. Um, and, uh, in the table of contents that labels it as New Testament letters and combat liberalism, a comparative reading, and it just sort of asks you to read them comparatively, basically <laughs> implicitly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the responsibility is on you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, uh, so if you're not really familiar with this essay, let me just tell you about it really quickly. It's very short and very interesting, and Dean and I both read it, and we feel like we might be a little liberal, um, which is probably inescapable, but we'll tell you why in a minute. So the essay is just like this kind of like taxonomy of different types of, uh, I guess, like different ways liberalism kind of rears its head in a society. Um yeah, so in, in the essay, Mao just goes through each one of them and just says, okay, this is liberal, this is liberal, this is liberal. And like, and then at the end, um, he just like uh, says, uh, all loyal, honest, active, and upright communists must unite to oppose the liberal tendencies shown by certain people among us and set them on the right path. This is one of the tasks of our ideological front. Um, so the idea here is that uh, Mao is uh, calling out liberaling th- labeling things as liberalism and then just like, so stop it. <laughs> um, <laughs> the the things that he lists as liberalism are actually pretty interesting, uh, especially coming off of some of those tense conversations during Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Very good Thanksgiving text. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> this is what you sh- everyone should have been reading before Thanksgiving, but... Uh, maybe this will kind of bolster your spirit for think uh, for Christmas Christmas dinners um, <laughs> <laughs> or like uh, candle candle light services uh, on Christmas Eve. Um, anyways, so it kind of goes through and just kind of um, lists things that um, are liberalism. And Dean and I uh, just kind of put them into two different categories: uh, the things that are sort of like personal problems in terms of liberalism, and things that are social problems in terms of liberalism. Uh, so, uh, we're going to go kind of go through them and kind of talk what's talk with, about like what's at stake with them. And then, uh, we're going to make those connections and do the, uh, do the reading of the new Testament letters as well. Uh, and, and do that, do that juxtaposition that needs to be done. So Dean, what's, what's up? Tell us why we should combat liberalism. Yeah. Okay. Here's it. Here it is. Um, so, uh, Mao identifies a bunch of, he, he does this kind of, ta- you know, typology, taxonomy of different forms of liberalism. I was thinking, thinking earlier, it's, it feels like an article that you would see in like a leftist version of like a Cosmo magazine or something. Uh, <laughs> like, I don't know, all the ways you might be a liberal and you didn't even know, or like, uh, like communist, communist secrets that'll like drive your man wild. Um, 11 types of liberalism. You won't believe in number yeah. six. Yeah, exactly. Or like, a, it's like one of those personality quizzes you take it and you find out if you're a liberal <laughs> or a revolutionary at the end. Right. Um, it's like the Enneagram, but for communism. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's the Enneagram, but there are only two two numbers. Uh, revolutionary, you... counter-revolutionary. <laughs> um, oh, man. Can, we need to get in touch with BuzzFeed about this really quick. <laughs> <laughs> that we do. Um so, yeah, like Matt was saying, we kind of artificially broke them down into a kind of maybe like a personal side of liberalism and a social side of liberalism. And then also uh, corresponding to that, what Mao thinks you should do instead. So uh, I'll just go through like some of the personal ones and then I'll, I'll toss it over to you for the social. We can chat about them. So uh, personally, um, one thing you shouldn't do is gossip. Mao says that is a form of liberalism. Uh, if you gossip behind people's backs, instead of basically uh bringing the problems that you have into the context of a party or a local community then you're a liberal um the, oh this could also be like a great jeff foxworthy kind of bit uh you might be oh, a liberal yeah. if um you <laughs> <laughs> will you actually you, uh, you just like read them like that from now on i'd really appreciate that <laughs> yeah sure okay so you might be a liberal if uh <laughs> there are issues that come up um, that are really important, but you just don't let them affect you and you avoid uh, blame or like being responsible for what you've done. Um, that's kind of liberalism. Uh, you might be a liberal if you know that you're making mistakes, but you don't do anything about them. You don't change them in your life. Uh, you might be a liberal if you are uh, really proud of what you do to contribute to social change, but you don't involve uh, yourself in like boring tasks because of that. So you, you view yourself as the great person of history. That is a liberal thing to do. Um, you might be a liberal if you just kind of go about life like a lazy, lazy person. The translation says muddling. If you muddle through life. Uh, without putting yourself into your work you might be a liberal if you uh, put your own opinions above the kind of uh, like general order of other people and you want special treatment from the party that could be liberal you might be a liberal if you refrain from uh, like calling out 
people that you love or your friends or whatever when you think that they have an error or they're wrong uh, out of a misguided desire not to rock the boat. So I call that the Thanksgiving principle of liberalism. Mm-hmm. Well, those are all the personal ones. So I'll, I'll just uh, I'll throw it over to you after, but maybe we could just chat about that. What do you think about that, Matt? These kind of these personal liberal problems. Yeah, um, these are pretty interesting. Uh, on the one hand, I think that Mao is probably right about these things, that these are actually types of liberalism uh, because they all um, rest on like someone prizing their individuality and their own sort of special feelings over the good of the group. Um, so, I mean, that makes sense. They're, they're liberal in the sense that they're individualistic. Uh, they're liberal in the sense that they're divisive and uh, that they don't necessarily support like the like the workers or like the Revolutionary Party or whatever. And at the same time, oh my God, I'm guilty of these things <laughs> completely. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, yeah, all of all of them, I think probably. Um, I don't know, at least most of them. I don't think I'm the revolu- I don't think I'm the like the the great man of history, even though I am. I know, in my heart. <laughs> You're um, pretty great. Pretty great man. Of oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I agree. You're welcome. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but that's it. Anyways, it's kind of interesting that um, Mao goes after these like specific, like kind of small, like nitpicky things. Um, that I, so again, I think he's right. I think that these are hard and like yeah, probably guilty. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, I don't know. In some cases, I just feel like uh, like maybe in some ways I'm too tied to my liberalism. Like I don't really want to give it up, and I like don't necessarily think that it is a bad thing. Like. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes I just like ignore issues that don't affect me because I just don't have the energy to like deal with them. It doesn't bother me. I just avoid all the blame and responsibility for it. Like, I don't know, whatever. Sometimes people are reactionaries and I just can't can't deal with it. Yeah. Well, the the Thanksgiving one you mentioned is probably the most difficult. Uh, Refrain from calling out uh, friends and acquaintances when they go astray out of a misguided desire not to rock the boat. Yeah, man, I don't know. It's true. Like, it is true that, like, one ought to do that. And I think that I have seen, (laughs) but I've, but okay, some, you, you ought to do that. I think it's probably a thing that you ought to do. But I've seen enough tweets this uh, past week from Thanksgiving to know that, like, that's a full time job. Um, (laughs) You should do that. I think absolutely. But at the same time, oh my gosh, good luck. I'll pray, I'll pray for you, I suppose. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I, I get it. Like, I get that it's important that you do need to call out uh, family and friends on um, their bad, uh, their bad opinions. But uh, it's also just hard. Uh, it's also hard because I think I have extreme social anxiety as well. So I feel yeah, exactly. incredibly <laughs> uncomfortable talking to people in general, not just about their bad opinions. Uh, yeah, I don't want to talk to anyone about anything. So <laughs> except this podcast, this H- is the only this one. Podcast, yeah. Yeah, it's great that no it's one a safe else place but to you broadcast. can. Yeah, no one else but you can talk to me on this. So it's like I'm. Safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, what do you think about these social ones? Maybe you, here I'll, I'll just rattle them off and then yeah, we can please. go through them. Please um, do. It. All right. <laughs> so uh, one is um, failing to uh, prevent or f- even feel kind of upset about counter-revolutionary views. That's one. Um, you might be a liberal if you don't if you don't care. When someone's kind of revolutionary, uh, you might be a liberal if you fail to spread your political views and agitate, uh, acting <laughs> like a normal person. That's how Mao puts it, instead of a communist. Uh, uh, it's pretty funny. Uh, you might be a liberal if you hear people say wrong things and you don't correct them uh, for their own dang good, says Mao. Uh, and you might also be a liberal if you make uh, personal attacks and like pick fights instead of promoting unity and debating uh, issues openly. So those are kind of like some social dimensions of liberalism, yeah. according to Mao. Uh, I feel better about those since they don't require me to actually talk to anybody necessarily. <laughs> um, uh, I I do actually, so I think I value the the more like social ones than over the over the personal ones, just because I think they're like um, they seem more pressing. Like failing to stop or feel indignant at wrong or counter revolutionary views is actually good. Like um, not letting people just sort of like skate by and just um like like when you hear someone say something that is actually like racist or bad or fascist uh in any way um and if you don't feel like indignant about that i think that's bad um yeah j- just because like uh you shouldn't let those those views get normalized or sh- you shouldn't give people like leeway because like oh man um 
well, they're conservative, so of course they think like that. Like, no, maybe maybe you should feel mad at that always. You should always feel mad right. when people are uh, <laughs> uh, saying dumb stuff. Yeah, it's true. The only weird thing about this is I just have these flashbacks to when there was a time in my life when I was like a very zealous evangelical Christian. And uh, I would like, basically I had all these same principles in my life, except that I, I thought that they were, you know, related to something else. Like it wasn't for being a revolutionary. It's like, um, well, if these people are wrong, they're going to go to hell. So mm. I like took that super ultra seriously and did all kinds of uh, evangelizing and like passing out tracks. And uh, <laughs> for here's like a, here's a real evangelical deep cut. If any of you have ever heard of a uh, way of the master or a uh, Ray comfort, like that was the thing that, that I was digging uh, all that good Kirk Cameron uh, mm, mm-hmm, programming mm-hmm. you know so uh like okay the ends of that are obviously dumb with respect especially to uh what mao is up to but at the same time like it kind of turns you into just like a, a crappy person to be around um and i don't want to become like a communist evangelical uh like that is like the worst <laughs> the worst possible thing right to be i think yeah, even though i, I kind so. of am like i've never really shedded that uh if you follow me on twitter you already know that <laughs> yeah but uh I, I don't like it about myself in any case right um again uh having having a level of social anxiety and just like not wanting to talk to people um <laughs> it's it's hard but i lately i've been feeling like um i've been being like a lot more expressive i guess in my political views because i think it's been it's been important I feel like I haven't done some of this in the past. Even as an evangelical Christian, I would probably never, I would never share my faith journey with anybody. I think that's really strange. Um, <laughs> but like lately, I've been feeling like um, more open to talking about uh, socialism with people, just because I think it's important, and also because I don't know. I think that like I don't know. Um, it's just like sort of like a matter of like uh, up until recently, maybe I don't feel like I've been like confident enough to talk about it, but maybe I do now, um, and I feel like it's. Uh, easy and easier and like just good to talk about it and uh, i can i can get down with it now where i couldn't maybe in the past um yeah but it's cool i don't know uh again even with the uh sort of like the the idea behind these like social views um about combating liberalism too is as against like uh putting putting the good of the party the good of the workers over one sort of like personal feelings about maybe p- making people annoyed at you um it's kind of interesting though, because there is definitely like a really evangelical logic to it. It's just like not hell, but um, reaction, reactionary right. uh, politics that's right. like at stake. <laughs> uh, I do. Uh, so I, I'm not a Maoist. I'm not even a Marxist Leninist. I'm, you know, right. We, we had we had the thing a while back. We took the political quiz. And I'm like further to the left, uh, the 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 uh, anti-authoritarian left and Dean. Um, still, I'm wearing that badge forever, I guess. Um, <laughs> Even though that's the case, uh, I do kind of appreciate this way of thinking from Mao a little bit, um, just because it shows like a real urgency behind the ideology that like, uh, in this case, like, I don't know, when Mao wrote this, he's like, he wrote it because he thought it was really important and that people like shouldn't be um, infighting and really petty in, in individualistic ways. And I think that is good. I don't yeah. know. What do you think, Dean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he won, so... Like yeah. it worked. Uh, I think it's just kind of a it's a weird thing. Party unity is a is a, a hard thing to sort out. Um, on the one hand, like I like it because obviously you should have a kind of unified movement, and it's cool to think about how uh, associating with human beings, no matter who they are, even if they agree with you, is really hard to do. And you kind of need yeah. a, like a spiritual discipline to help you get through that. And yeah. it's interesting to see Mao trying to come up with one. Um, but at the same time, uh, I can't ever get like the kind of work that Amaria does and a, a lot of other people too, but we had Amaria on the show a long time ago. So you can go back and listen to that if you want. Um, I can't get that kind of work out of my head where uh, like unity often conceals the way in which you're actually kind of overlooking something or excluding yeah. someone, even if it's in the name of liberation. Yeah, mm-hmm. you might be, you know, unintentionally or intentionally in some cases uh not admitting certain perspectives so yeah uh that is like the thing that just nags at me i guess a little bit um but it's like it's just a problem like it's not a problem to solve i guess it's just a problem that should probably continue to nag and maybe that's also like a good spiritual discipline like Mm -hmm. being willing to get nagged a little bit (laughs) yeah i think so um that's a good a good point 
Um, um, what do you think about these Bible verses, Matt? Yeah, that's where things get a little more interesting. Okay, so there are a handful of these New Testament letters that, I mean, just are the Pauline letters. Ephesians, First Thessalonians, Titus. Man, Titus, that's a book that I've not thought about since Bible quizzing. Uh, First Peter, <laughs> and then Philippians. Those are, the, those are the sort of like the passages that they kind of cite and juxtapose right alongside uh, Mao and combat liberalism. Um, and they're actually these kind of like in these moments in each of those letters where Paul is being sort of instructive to, I, I guess, these different churches in these different places. Again, uh, Dean and I don't know anything about theology and are probably pretty poor biblical scholars, but we'll do our best here. Um, well, we, we know some things about theology. We can hang, but like, you know, not great. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. I don't want to like. I, I don't know anything about theology. Maybe is is the better uh, better thing to say. No, um, I also don't. I would rather invite uh, theologians to do that work uh, yeah. instead of being responsible for it. Okay. Well, good theologians get asked. Maybe. Um, okay. So <laughs> some of the New Testament letters though are pretty interesting. Uh, so this is from Ephesians. Uh, you must give up your old way of life. You must put aside your old self, which gets corrupted by following illusory uh, illusory desires. Your mind must be renewed by a spiritual revolution so that you can put on the new self that has been created in God's way uh, and the goodness and holiness of the truth. So from now on, there must be no more lies. You must speak the truth to one another since we are all parts of one another. Let your words be for improvement of others as the occasion offers and do good to your listeners. Okay, Dean, how does this connect? Uh, I mean, just straight up Maoism, right? Who said it, right? Just, it's like uh, basically. Uh, okay, so maybe the new game is then uh, just like Mao or Paul. Like, who said this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's another it's funny, good though. BuzzFeed quiz. <laughs> yeah, it's funny though because it's like um, a very similar sort of idea that like um, the community is only is going to be is the community of like believers, whether it's uh, uh, whether it's like. Maoists uh, or early Christians is like the community is only going to be as good as it is self-critical um, yeah, and yeah, I can appreciate sure. that I think um, so like unity is I think I don't know to, to, to me at least here like there's a there's a sense of unity in the sense that like people should be open to self-criticism and like unified in that sense um, I think I can get behind some of that yeah, uh, for sure. okay so the next one is first Thessalonians um, be at peace among yourselves, and this is what we ask you to do. Warn the idlers, give courage to those who are apprehensive, care for the weak, and be patient with everyone. Make sure that people do not try to take revenge. You must all think of what is best for each other and for the community. Again, it's putting the community ahead of the individual, and I I don't know. I'm in. It's hard, I guess, but yeah. I'm in. I think that's cool. Um, and again, it sounds like uh, Paul or Mao. It, it could be either at this point. Um Okay, there's a few others. Um, let's just skip ahead though to some of these other ones. Um, okay, this, these are these are the two from Titus. Again, a book I kind of forget about all the time. The Bible's got a lot of weird ones at the end there. A lot of ones I don't remember. <laughs> I have to sing the song in my head every time. Um, the Bible, the Bible book song, so I can remember which ones come next. Okay, <laughs> I didn't even know there was a Bible book song. That sounds uh, good. Yeah, man. Uh, that's again. Uh, it's uh, because I was in Bible quizzing. Um, nice. I guess. Not really, but okay. <laughs> uh, if a person disputes what you teach, then after a first warning, have no more to do with that person. I like this one actually a lot. Uh, you will know that any person <laughs> of that sort has already lapsed and is self-condemned as a sinner. Okay, this is one that's probably less <laughs> less Mao and more Paul, but I like it a lot because it's just like, yeah, that person I agree with you? Oh, you can cut them off from your life completely. Um, I can get behind that a whole lot. That's actually my approach to Twitter. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, just block uh block and move on um, <laughs> <laughs> that's good okay and then uh this one i think is a little bit there's a, some liberty taken with this translation in first peter but never be a dictator over any group uh that is put in your charge be an example uh that the whole community can follow okay these are nice these are good these are some good yeah. bible verses right here that i am perfectly happy to take right out of historical context and completely ignore <laughs> um, but non nonetheless, they're instructive for uh, the ways that churches should act and uh, the ways that communities of people should act. And uh, I think what we can draw from, I think, both Mao and the letters uh, that Paul writes to those churches um, is that, like, you should care about your community, even if it means you have to, like, say something not necessarily mean, but something that is self-critical of your community. That seems important. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of one of like the most meaningful and also the most difficult uh experiences I've ever had in school was in my undergraduate 
uh, experience, uh, whereas in this like upper division level class, and it was like a theology class. It was called Methods in Theology, and it was hard um, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> Uh, anyways, uh, there's this one kid that was really, uh, like dominating the conversation and we went to the teacher and we were like, Hey, can you tell this guy to please stop talking so we can like have different conversations? And the teacher's like, well, if you really care about him, uh, and you really care about the community of your class, you should tell him yourself. And that was very hard. <laughs> <laughs> that, that wise, wise mouse to rhetoric. Yeah, I know. But like, it is. It is important and difficult all at the same time to actually care yeah. so much that you might upset somebody else. Uh, maybe maybe other people have less of a hard time with this, but maybe since we are from the Midwest, we are particularly polite. I don't really know. Uh, that might not be the <laughs> truth. might not be the case, but uh, that is at least one feeling I have. <laughs> it's hard to confront yeah. people and tell them uh, maybe think a different way. Yeah, it's true. Um, it's also interesting to kind of see all this in light of – I guess what has happened since Donald Trump, like the liberal kind of lines haven't really changed in some ways. Like in, uh, on the one hand, uh, the way that Mao inflates the term of liberalism is kind of uh, like kind of difficult. Basically it's just like, nah, this is liberalism. He never like defines what liberalism is. It's just kind of a series of uh, accusations that you're meant to be like, well, I, I don't want to be one of those, I guess. So yeah, I won't be. Um, but there actually is, uh, there's a lot happening underneath it and it's kind of translated, I think, into more contemporary terms. Uh, like for example, um, (laughs) one thing that liberals don't like about, uh, leftists is that they actually say what they think, even when it like, I don't know, kind of hurts somebody's feelings. And it's not because leftists are necessarily trying to be mean. I mean, sometimes they are leftists can be mean, but like Mm -hmm. sometimes they're just saying like, sorry, uh, black people are getting murdered a ton. And, like, this is a society that murders black people. And liberals want to downplay that because it makes them feel bad or makes other people feel bad. Um, And that's kind of exactly what Mao, I think, is getting at, is that there is a kind of liberal assumption that is premised on a whole philosophy that we've, you know, imbibed, I guess, uh, unintentionally, that says that individuals are important. And, you know, it's sort of as long as it's not hurting anybody else, then it's fine kind of Mm -hmm. mentality. Yeah. Um, but the irony is that those principles only ever get employed uh, at like the worst, uh, least opportune times uh, that like obscure the real material problems underneath them. Yeah. Um, on that same point, uh, there's a little bit later on in that uh, in combat liberalism where Mao says um, uh, people who are liberals look upon the principles of Marxism as abstract dogma. They approve of Marxism, but are not prepared to practice it um, or to practice it in full. They are not prepared to replace their liberalism by Marxism. Is that kind of idea that you're describing, though, where it's like, oh, man, I love these sort of like um, I love like the romantic idea of uh, revolution. And I think that workers rights are very good, but like I'm not ready to actually change my life in any way. Um, Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Hillary Clinton giving a speech at like a union, which she did a bunch. And then she would talk about how she was all about the workers. But at the end of the day, she had no intention of uh, really creating much of a fuss in the capitalist order anyway. So uh, there you go. Liberalism. Yeah, totally. Um, This kind of reminds me a little bit of a callback here, I guess, to when we talked to Matt Sittman. Um, uh, He had this kind of good, uh, a good turn of phrase to describe liberalism that's really stuck with me. Matt said that uh, liberalism was a politics of separation. And Mm -hmm. I think that's such a good way of thinking about it. And even I think it's even in line with, I mean, like the way that Mao's describing it, but a little bit more... uh, I don't know, descriptive, uh, less, <laughs> less just sort of a tacky, but it's fine. Um, but like uh, liberalism is a, f- a political philosophy of separation insofar as it separates people into individuals. It separates, um, I don't know, all types of organizations uh, like branches of government and so on. Uh, it separates, you know, things from public and private market and public, um, all kinds of things like that. Right. It's a, it's yeah. a, a type of political economy that's that's solely built off of like separating things out into sort of like atomized pieces. Um, and at least what this, this bit, this essay does here and the Bible verses that have been juxtaposed against it do is it calls out a type of communal thinking that we have completely lost sight of uh, as Christian people. And I think as leftists largely too, just we, we have a hard time thinking of like, um, do our opinions do, does the way we act amongst other people, does the way that we uh I don't know, uh, handle social situations actually, um, like 
are they impacted by the real like leftist values that we hold or do we still kind of have this liberalism that we'll never get rid of? And I think to a certain extent, like, I don't know, being people who uh, did grow up in like an incredibly individualistic evangelical Christianity, uh, who people who live in an incredibly individualistic and capitalistic uh, capitalism in the United States, uh, it is probably hard and impossible to purge oneself of this entire uh, entirely just because of like the sedimentation of liberalism over time and how it's probably been like inscribed in our bodies in some very delusing ways. Um, but I think it's helpful to call them out in this way. It makes you conscious of, um, the community that you are not fully a part of because you're too individualistic. Yeah. And the other benefit of it is if you do participate in a community that you trust, uh, you can receive criticism in a way that I think is a little less, um, uh, like wounding because the hmm. assumption is that the only reason somebody's willing to criticize you or bring an issue up with you isn't because they want to like get under your skin, but it's because they're like, Hey, listen, I don't know if you know this, but like, this is not very helpful. And you know, you can kind of hopefully like if someone's not like a total jerk and doesn't have a history of that or whatever, but if they're actually, you know, doing things alongside you, like you can take that criticism as a, a helpful tool to help you, um, just help people uh in more effective ways um i always think about like um we mentioned this a lot or i mentioned a lot at least on the podcast but that herbert mccabe essay on the class struggle in christian love yeah where he says uh the best thing about the beatitudes is that uh jesus gives us tools to be really good comrades uh and i think that makes a lot of sense right that um there's this kind of spiritual discipline within leftist movements that is supposed to be helpful and supposed to draw people together because they genuinely trust and like each other uh rather than in liberalism where you're like forced to be together because you were like born into a family or Mm -hmm. because you got stuck in this country or because you have to go home for thanksgiving because of all these social obligations like (laughs) i don't know hopefully it's uh not exactly like that right yeah um it's also there's also a sense in in like sort of in sort of the liberal paradigm of thinking uh when someone comes and critiques you and says something like you know that you need to change about your life and kind of gives you some type of critical feedback um liberalism makes it difficult to really accept even just because like individuals are are like supposed to like implicitly compete with one another um right so like you know we always take uh we always take that type of criticism as like oh my gosh someone's like possibly threatening me in in x y or z way when actually they care about you or something right like the idea that you would you would possibly say something that is hard to someone because you actually care about them is an idea that at least to me feels very lost like i if yeah. it feels like so out of the ordinary that you'd actually do that to somebody um, That's true. so it's weird um it's it's weird completely um and even like <laughs> <laughs> it's weird because like i don't know like communities like are things that don't even know how to do this anymore We've lost like the vernacular for like being friendly and like self-critical and it is hard. Yeah, that's right. Um, It's also strange because uh, I feel like liberalism tries to imagine a community of decency that kind of papers over uh, very not just indecent, but extremely brutally violent things underneath it. Mm -hmm. Um, Probably the best example of this I always get to is uh, the rehabilitation of James Comey, the FBI director who got fired. Um, Oh, yeah after Trump became the president. So like, uh, Comey was immediately embraced by loads and loads of liberals as being, you know, part of the resistance. Uh, (laughs) like he was this, uh, this guy who just wanted to be a decent guy, you know, he didn't do anything wrong. He was just Mm -hmm. nice. And like Trump fired him. And, uh, Trump's biggest problem is that he's just like a big, ugly nerd who like fires people all the time. Um, and so as a result, Comey becomes this hero. Uh, but the crazy thing about that is like, James Comey was the head of the FBI. Like, I don't know if people know about the FBI, but it's not good. It is bad. Uh, <laughs> like, it ruins people's lives. Uh, and just during Obama's presidency, James Comey was an all lives matter guy. Like, he mm. was basically being like, you know, the police aren't so bad. Like, this is the head of the FBI saying this stuff. And if he's willing to say that publicly, like, that doesn't really bode well for, uh, like, actual political change in this country or in that country. I don't live there anymore. But uh, it's like, it's weird because when you bring that up uh, and you talk about James Comey, um, people get really defensive all of a sudden. I just had a Twitter exchange kind of on this very topic. I I made the tweet about how, like, I guess James Comey is really into uh, Ronald Niebuhr and all these articles are coming out about how great it is and how he's super smart and 
um i don't know how he like he like actually understands Niebuhr's theology or something. Mm-hmm. But I made this tweet about how like if the FBI director likes a certain theologian, you should probably just like throw that theologian away. Like they're not very valuable. Yeah. Some people responded to that well, I guess, but other people were like, um, you know, well, uh, that doesn't like mean anything about this particular theologian, and also like having police that are subject to the rule of law, that's a good idea. And it's like, what in what world are these kind of principles operative where they don't actually ever matter when something specific happens? Uh, I think that's right. sort of the strength of a materialist critique of liberalism is you look at how these principles in fact play out rather than just looking at them as, I don't know, nice things to hold your community together. Because communities that aren't held together by decency. Communities like actual good ones uh, are held together by like really giving yourself up for another person. I think that is not actually what liberalism does. Yeah, that's true. Huh. Uh yeah, the the Reinhold Niebuhr thing is such a weird a weird situation. I think uh wasn't it wasn't the case too like uh a while back that like that was Barack Obama's favorite theologian as well? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um uh I have very little opinions on Reinhold Niebuhr only because the only exposure I have to him is reading um uh, like Stanley Hauerwas and John Howard Yoder, who both like hate Reinhold Niebuhr. <laughs> so like all I know is that he sucks. Uh, <laughs> but like, but coming from like the post liberal guys, uh, it doesn't mean much to me either. Yeah, but I, I mean, just a, as a basic premise, like if uh, if a theologian can be beloved by both the director of the FBI and the president that didn't agree with him, like maybe there's a underlying problem. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, it's a if uh, if those two people are really uh, really into Reinhold Niebuhr, then it says something about Reinhold Niebuhr's theology. <laughs> it's like a theology that yeah. allows for like uh, drone attacks on children. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly, uh, and and like the unity of liberalism, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I don't know why I got on that rant, but I guess I just I you know I have so many thoughts about James Comey. I've got to get him off my chest somewhere, and Twitter is just not enough. So here we are. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good it's a good rant. Um, <laughs> well. Okay, I don't know. Um, let's let's wrap this podcast up in an extremely evangelical way, um, a real good Protestant way. Uh, here's just a little an bit of a call. yeah. Well, no, not that way. Like we could uh, no <laughs> do that. Do that in your own time. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a little bit of a like a weekly challenge. Just like when you leave when you leave this place, just go out into the world and try to do this. Uh, think about what it actually might mean to correct somebody when they say something incredibly bad and uh, and how that actually would play out. Um, think about like how much you actually care about your community and if it's worth if it's worth correcting somebody uh, that might be revealing about the types of communities that you actually are part of, uh, whether or not they are illusory or real. Um, a really like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't like. I don't want to say more than that. It's fine. I'm done. I'm done talking. <laughs> Maybe cut that uh, part from Pastor the podcast. Matt is is a good a good pastor. Yeah, that's right. Um, maybe to end this conversation, I'll read this uh, this last this last juxtaposed New Testament letter here. Um, it's a good one. If our life in Christ means anything to you, if love can persuade all, then be united in convictions and united in your love with a common purpose and a common mind. That is the one thing which would make me completely happy. There must be no competition among you, no conceit, but everybody is to be self-effacing, always considering the other person to be better than yourself, so that nobody thinks uh, that nobody thinks of his or her own interest, but everybody thinks of other people's interests instead. That's from Philippians two. I think that's the way that Donald Trump says it. <laughs> uh, two Philippians. Uh, two Philippians. That's right. Good point. Um, okay, cool. I don't know. Think about our communities hard. <laughs> So that's the moral <laughs> of that story. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. Um, thank you for uh, persisting with us through this uh, <laughs> this uh, episode full of goofs and uh, good Maoist uh, thoughts and good New Testament thoughts. All of it. We got it all. We got Maoism. We got Christianity. It's all right here. Um, so, uh, if you don't already, definitely follow us on Twitter. Uh, Dean has been in charge of the Twitter account lately and he's been tweeting some very good stuff. So make sure you go and like all of that. Um, really important, uh, side, side note conversation that I should have said earlier. Uh, we got t-shirts coming up. You can pre-order a t-shirt. Uh, if you look at our Twitter account, uh, there is a, uh, we'll, we'll pin the tweet where you can go and try to get, uh, sign up for a t-shirt made by Benjamin Wildflower. 
Um, it's a really cool uh, anti-white supremacy uh, Mary T. You're gonna you'll see a picture of it and you'll be like, oh, gotta get that. Uh, so sign up for one of those, pre-order it, tell us what size shirt you wear, and uh, we'll tell you when you can buy them from us for, I don't know, not very much money, but a little bit of money because it costs money to pay people to make t-shirts, as we found. Okay, uh, also, uh, subscribe to us on iTunes. Um, if you uh, if you haven't done, done so already, it'd be great if you could leave us a review. Um, that helps us uh, and helps other people know about our podcast. Uh, cool, so uh, catch you next time. Get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord.